Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Fish Bites, the Miami Herald's Miami Marlins podcast. I'm Jordan McPherson. He's Andre Fernandez, returning from a week hiatus. Dre, how are you? I am good. I'm fresh off the 4th of July weekend. Got a chance to go up to North Florida. My wife went up to St. Augustine and a little pit stop in Jacksonville for a couple of days, too, where uh, we saw a friend. Good old <laughs> scampy. Caught some fireworks. Watched the jumbo shrimp. Picked up a t-shirt. So, yeah, I always love that experience with the jumbo shrimp. They had a nice crowd. They had a nice crowd on 4th of July night. 4th of July night, which the game flew because that was the game that they won one zip on a Lewin Diaz walk-off double off the right field wall. That, that was pretty exciting. But until then, I mean, it was like about an hour and a half to breeze through eight innings, which four of those innings went to Eliezer Hernandez on his ticket back up to the to the majors before he did that. So so yeah, so pretty good. Pretty good to see. Pretty good to catch up and see the see some uh jumbo shrimp ball up there. Yeah, no, that ballpark is great. I still I already told I've told Scott Kornberg, their main P- person on the PR side, that I need to get up there at some point. Looking like it's probably me second half of the season, which considering we only have one week left until the all star break. But I'm gonna have to get back up there at some point. I've been there since 2019, back when they were the double A affiliate. Yeah. But I love that ballpark. I mean, between the times I've gone up there for Marlin stuff and even before that, my time at UF, UF and FSU mm-hmm. always did one of their three games in Jacksonville every year. It was one game in Gainesville, one game in Tally, and one game in Jacksonville at a neutral site. Yeah. And just the atmosphere there was always incredible. Yeah, yeah, it was a good time. Uh, Scott does a great job up there with the team. And and even before that, Rod, Roger Hoover is not there anymore. But uh, shout out to Roger, you know, and and – they were always, you know, first class up there. So glad to see they're doing well. Yep. And now to shift back to the big league club. Uh, last week, split with the Angels, split with the Mets. To me, at a minimum, they did what they needed to do last week. So they kept themselves in the playoff race to take two of four against the Mets, especially after the first game getting sh- getting shellacked and nothing. Won the second game. I think it was five to two. Should have won game, should have, could have possibly won game three, lost it five to four in extra innings after a couple of really bad plays with two outs, and then won the finale in extra innings two nothing behind another gem by second time all star Sandy Alcantara. And then was hoping to carry that momentum into Monday when they started a four game series with the Pirates at home. Yeah, that didn't happen. 5 1 loss, Mitch Keller just completely shut them down for seven innings and the Marlins at this point with where they are in the standings with, and I feel like I just being like being on this, like a dead horse every single week, they're four out of the wild card spot. This, this series against the pirates. And the, when they face them right after the all-star break and what, and the series against the reds, they need to take advantage of those games. It's just, it's as simple as that. If they want to stay in this and they need to make sure that the loss on Monday was more an aberration than what might, than a regularity over these next couple weeks. Yeah. I mean, Mitch Keller, young pitcher, 26 years old, three and six, four, eight, eight, four, eight, eight ERA. He even said it was the first time it was seven innings. It happens. I mean, it's not, but like you said, if it's a blip and they bounce back the next three days, then you're fine. But if it spirals a little bit, you basically kick your momentum in the gut that you, that you've picked up now to get yourself, you know, at least back in the conversation in the wild card race, which Got to give them credit for that because, I mean, I've been one of the people that thought that they were pretty much done when they were seven, eight out, but they, they've been resilient and they've gotten themselves kind of hovering around the 500 mark. We'll see. I mean, it's still going to be a hard thing to sustain because, you know, as we've seen, they, they feasted a lot on the Nationals and a lot of people are looking at the rest of the record against the rest. Well, here's your chance to prove it because, you know, after this Pirate series, the Phillies are coming in. That's going to be a huge weekend series for them to kind of stay in that race. And it's not a surprise too, because they got a few of the guys that, you know, the, to me, their biggest, their most important offseason move, Joey Wendell has been back. He's been contributing. I mean, they're, they're more, the picture came back together after all these weeks of having guys out, not completely, but a lot more where you can see kind of what they can do in that lineup once that everyone's kind of, you know, clicking together. And like you, you, you say, the would have, could haves and all that, you know, for years we've seen them blow a series like that where either at the 10 nothing game carries over and they get swept or maybe they have that one game to tie it up at one and then the frustrating loss and then that's it and then the next day another frustrating loss so to their credit 
Sunday, hung in there, scoreless stalemate with Sandy, and then finally winning it in extra innings, which, by the way, I, I, I still cannot. I get that you don't want 18 inning marathons, but I kind of wish they'd push that a little more into the like maybe it started in the 11, started in the 12. The run around like, second rule you're talking. Yeah, about. the run around second rule. It's like they made they made baseball into the college football overtime, and like I I I don't I'm not a fan. I mean I know it works. It worked for them once. It, it it's gonna be that way. It's gonna work sometimes. It won't. I've seen it with other teams, but I feel like it cheapens it. I'm glad it's now during the regular season. I mean not you know later on in the postseason when when you really have to decide these games and truly so i guess in that sense it's a little bit like the, the comparing it to other sports i guess it's like kind of like hockey where you you do it in the regular season so you won't have marathon overtimes or anything like that but in the playoffs when it matters i'm glad that they're not yeah but i will say the marlins to their credit have set their roster up for when they get to those situations they're able to just throw a guy a billy hamilton at second base and no matter, and it seems like one little mistake from the opposition, he's already scored. That's what we right. saw on Sunday. Yeah, yeah and that's been still, clever. He, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, no, and and I don't know how much longer he's gonna be on there. Again, once both Jazz Chisholm Jr. and Jorge Soler come back from the IL, to Luke Williams is gonna be one of the guys who gets sent down, and Billy Hamilton just based off of the roster is that's the other guy unless they get crafty and creative and start start making start with the trade movements, but. I would just selfishly want to see one game. Billy Hamilton starting batting ninth, John Birdie leadoff, Jazz Chisholm Jr. second. Have the three speed guys back to back to back in the lineup just once. Yeah. Selfishly, I yeah. want to see that happen. I mean, look, I mean, Billy Hamilton right now at this point in his career, you know, where he's kind of been bouncing around, you find a great role for him right now that's helping you a ton. I mean, it's winning your games. I mean, that's. I mean, it, it felt like deja vu. I had I had just looked before that happened on Sunday. I had just looked, and there was a there was a video clip that said that from the night before when it said Billy Hamilton scores on error, and I had looked at it again and seen that, and I'm like, okay. And then your I think it was your tweet popped up that said Billy Hamilton scores, and I'm like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, is this the old? I'm like, wait, how far of a delay do I have here? What if I? Deja yeah. vu again. So yeah. I mean, it shows you the, the the utility of that. Yeah, no, and I almost thought the whole game was going to be deja vu, considering the two first two guys Tanner Scott had to face on Sunday were Tomas Nito, who hit the double that honestly Brian Anderson should have found a way to keep that ball in the infield. He let it score past him when he tried to get make the backhand that scored the first run, and then Brandon Nimmo, who scored on Tanner Scott's error when he threw the ball into the ground. So when yeah. it was they scored the runs, and then it was those first two guys up. I was like. Is this going to happen again, back to back mm -hmm. nights? And then they, like you said, they found a way to to not to not mess it up two days in a row and not let it spot let things spiral. And then, and while they didn't spiral, the Marlins are also lucky that when you look at the standings, the teams directly ahead of them, they're not hold, they haven't been holding their own, and that's what another factor has helped keep the Marlins in the race even after they drop a game here, a game there. You look at their. From the third, the Phillies and the Cardinals are the two teams holding down the third wild card spot at this point. Yeah. San Francisco is a couple games behind them. The Marlins are four games out from St. Louis and Philly. San Francisco has lost 15 of their last 21 games. They're just one game over 500 now. And yeah. the Cardinals, since the Marlins won that series finale against them with the Avisail Garcia go ahead home run, Cardinals are four and eight. And all of those games have come against the NL East. They've played. They played two series against the Phillies. They played a series against the Braves. They're going to face the Dodgers. They're facing the Dodgers over the next three games. And now you're seeing, again, sort of like with the Marlins feasting off the Nationals, you've been seeing teams like the Cardinals feasting off the rest of their division, the Pirates, the Cubs, yeah. the Cubs, the Reds. And now that it's the matter of also seeing what these other teams who are playoff caliber are doing against playoff teams and things like that. It's the, it's the nature of the schedule. I mean, you could say that it's them feasting and, you know, like I did before about the Nationals and all of that, but it, it's going to look, it's going to be, a, it's going to be hard for them to sustain and stay in this because you, you really find out about teams later down the stretch, both in terms of endurance, you know, your, your veteran leadership that can carry you through a, you know, a potential, you know, playoff stretch toward the end. So in August it's going to be, you know, it, the rest of this month, really, because you're going to have to find out some of these key matchups and then dictating what decisions you make at the deadline but 
let's go in our hypothetical bubble here and say that they they stay in it and the moves they make are to compete for the playoffs this year you know then you gotta you gotta figure out how to stay healthy in august then so that's september etc cetera, etc cetera. but there is something to be said for taking care of business with the teams you're supposed to be and that's one area i think that you see growth from your guys that have been in the league now a couple of years and also the veteran pieces that that have come in and that blend right there that's something that you know it's worth mentioning because that this team in the past would do stuff like this where they'd go and get you know split a series with the mets or four or with atlanta or whatever and then turn around and you know poop the bed against the, you know the, the 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 bottom feeding reds or whoever you know and I mean, I'm saying this in three days from now, it might be a different tune if the Pirates end up doing that to them. No, I mean, we saw, it, I mean we, saw this, we saw this last year with the Pirates. And the, that right. they were they took the series against Philly, got within, I think it was, I think they got into second in the East last year in June. Then right. they had that three city road trip, Boston, Toronto, and Pittsburgh. They went one and eight in that trip, including one and three yeah. against the same Pittsburgh Pirates. Right. And this is that critical point where you can't let that happen. But to this point right now, the 12 and one against Washington is an example of them not letting that happen because there's been plenty of opportunities to screw up some games against Washington. There were some some of those extra inning nail biters against Washington mm -hmm. and they came out on top. So that I, I, what I what I mean is that is what they weren't doing in the past. And right. I think that's mentioning the growth and that mix that they have now, especially when they're healthy, when they actually have some of these pieces like Wendell and others in there, you see how this team is, has progress to the point where they can at least take care of business and pad their record a little bit to stay in it. Now, the next step is coming through in a big series this weekend against Philly, you know, beating, you know, uh, uh, beating the Giants when you have to, beating the Cardinals when you have to. I'm just throwing names. I know there's like schedule, different teams on the schedule, beating, well, and beating the other division teams too, because even let's say if you're not thinking you're going to catch Atlanta or the Mets, but you got to get wins against those teams. That have beaten you so much in the past. You can't. You can't afford. You're not going to make it if you're four and fifteen against one of these teams. And then this this past weekend, that was a positive step for them because the Mets had been slapping them around a little bit. And now you, you take two out of four, almost got three out of four. That's something to build on. Yeah. So right now, Marlins standings against the rest of the NL East again, twelve and one as you mentioned against Washington. They are right now four and three against Philly, four and seven against the Mets, and four and five against the Braves. So the right. three, the three teams and in the four division four coming from coming from it was two, two and five and, before that. Right. So you're starting to make a little headway there if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Two and five, and those first four they were without four starters. The first four when they went, yeah. I think it was one and three. They were without Aguilar, Sanchez, Wendell, and and Anderson. And that's and what that we're going to find yeah. out. That's what we're going to find out if it was that, you know. If, and now with this team being a little more healthy and and you know potentially getting healthier. Can that really truly make a difference over the next few weeks and months? Yeah. And again, we got the rest of the schedule for July. They've got three more with the Mets at the end of the month, basically the last full series before the before the trade deadline. Before that, they have, as we mentioned, the remaining three games against Pittsburgh this series, three more against Philly, then the all-star break, one game at home against the Rangers, part of the quirky way that the league is making up those first week of games that got canceled. A game at home against Texas, then straight to the road with three more against Pittsburgh, four more against Cincinnati, then home for Stop the three it. Stop Cincinnati. at your house. Pick up your mail. You're heading out again. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I've been on the road. I got back yesterday after two weeks on the road. And Pick up this your is mail, be... do your laundry, and off yeah. you go. Yep. <laughs> Take everything out of the suitcase, put in washer, put in dryer, put back in suitcase, head back to airport. Yep. And we're just yep. talking about Jordan. <laughs> yeah so it's gonna be a hectic busy next couple weeks on that front and more or less in the next week and a half we'll know we'll have a better understanding of what the marlins are going to do come august 2nd when the trade deadline hits and yeah. the long long and short of it if they buy the two main things they need to get another bat ideally someone who is good defensively in the outfield this way you can and if you can, someone who's ideally good in center field, this way you can start shifting Jesus Sanchez over to left field and get another bullpen arm. Because as good as their back end has been, Anthony Bass, Stephen Oker, and Tanner Scott, outside of the three, of you can't sustain by having the three of them going every single day. They're going to crash and burn. 
you need to be able to get another guy to add into that mix and find him, find a way to be able to sort of do what they were doing before with the mixing and matching, albeit with more steady roles and just to give guys a breather. I mean, Tanner Scott's pitched in, I think, all but two or three games in July already. He's going to, as good as he's been, and again, we've seen a couple clunkers, which, again, no closure is going to be perfect, not even, not even the best, not even the All-Stars. But the more the more he has to go out there on an almost daily basis, the, more, the bigger the likelihood that a crashing and burning, the wear and tear is going to hit him. And then sort of like, and I'll talk to you this deeper, sort of like with Sandy, I understand with Donnie taking him out in the seventh inning because he's already hitting 130 innings for the All-Star. Yeah, but we don't yeah. We don't know what's going to happen once he gets over the 200th threshold. And it's just yeah. a matter of yeah. being cautious before to get them into August, September to make sure that you have your roster as close to full as possible in the long run. He's spoiling them right now with these yeah. seven, eight innings every start minimum. But mm -hmm. at some point, that streak will probably end. And then on top of that, what about the other four starters? They're not giving them seven or eight the way Sandy does. No. So you need that back end to be secure. I, I am all in on you know, one or even more bullpen arms, whatever you can get to reinforce that 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 part of it because you need to. And and down the stretch, especially when those innings add up, like you were saying with Sandy, not just Sandy, but all, a lot of these guys, when those innings add up, and they will if they're still in it in August and September, you bet around the league always you need as many arms as you can. And then think about the long term. Think about, let's say, again, let's step even deeper into this hypothetical yep. bubble that everyone is excited about. If they do make it, and they're you know how many when you hit the playoffs, no one's going deep into games anymore unless you're future Hall of Famer starter, you know like a Kershaw or somebody like your managers are taking guys out after two three innings when they get into a jam and you're mixing and matching and all that. That's why to me all in on the pen if you can get now at the deadline if, assuming they're in the position still. In a couple of weeks, it, well, which it's looking likely that in a couple of weeks, if they can kind of keep staying hovering where they are, that they do have at least a shot at the third wild card. So, yeah, and also, uh, I just lost my train of thought there. Wow, it's they're, early they're, they're, they're the cutoff yeah. point. Yeah, they're the cutoff point for the playoffs right now. It's like they're the last team that's really like in Correct. realistic contention for it, right? Yeah, now. because so, the next team, the next team outside of the Marlins, the Marlins are four under. The next team is Arizona, who's seven under. And at that right. point, nine, seven under, seven games back, a, nine under 500, I should say. Right. With a few teams ahead of you. Yeah. Yes. I mean, 41 and 44 on a typical year without a third wild card. No. But this year, they have the lifeline. Now, if they get on a little bit of a run where, you know, they don't even have to be where you win 10 in a row. But if they get on a run where you're winning more often than not and you get yourself above 500, then. Then it's a little more. Realistic. Yeah, and, as, so and you're doing and you're doing it against the teams ahead of you. I.e., if they're able to just hold their own with Philly, right? Well, and that's why having the NL East, it's yeah. like the right. It's like right now with the what's going on in the AL East, which is insane. With even the Orioles getting back in it now, yeah, with that winning streak. I mean, not even back in it, just in it. How long yeah. has it been since they've even been in it? But any, but point being, like with the National League East now, with a lot of teams, with everyone except the Nationals involved, yes, you're fighting. Of, you're going to have all those opportunities because you have all those division games. So even better for them. Yeah. And since you brought it up, would you have imagined if I said to you on at the beginning of the season, on July 12th, both the Marlins and the, and the Orioles are in contention for the playoffs going into basically going into the all-star break. What would you have said to me? Well, well no, I, it, I would have put it in an even simpler, funnier way than that. If you would have told me, don't even tell me the records, but if you would have told me that at this point in the season, Baltimore has a better record than the Marlins, I would have asked you how many people already got fired on the Marlins staff because I would have assumed they were like 25 games under and this meant that they were the worst team in the league and Baltimore was the second worst team in the league. <laughs> like if you, that's the way you would have pulled the prank on me. Just, just tell me that the Orioles had a better record and I would have been like, Jesus, how bad did this get? <laughs> that would have been, but... It's remarkable, and it, it's just amazing that that not to we're really 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 quick tangent that AL East in the playoffs is going to be amazing with the Yankees surging the way they have been, and everyone having a chance. I mean, I firmly believe four teams will get in from that division. I mean, the, the, the it will be hilarious if the Orioles are, can actually become one of those four teams and knock somebody else out that people are expecting. But yeah, and then on the National League side, 
it could very easily be three teams from the NL East this year. You know, the way it's, I mean, I still think the Braves at some point, even if they struggle in this series, they're having this week with the Mets. I still think they're going to end up taking the division. It's a matter of time. And, <laughs> yeah. And then at that point, it's up for grabs between the Phillies and Marlins, maybe for that third spot. Yeah. Yeah. And then the Mets would be the top wild card. San Diego right now is holding its own, holding its own as the second wild card. Going to be got two and a half months and actually have some entry going into this, not just development. Yeah, not just out of it in May. Right. Which yeah. is where they were headed for a little while there. And honestly, honestly, when they were seven, eight games back, we really, I, I thought it's here we go again, but you know, they got healthier and now it's just a matter of, can they sustain? We'll see. Yeah. And now the shift to the festivities that are going to be happening out in LA over in a little bit less than a week. Uh, start with the big show. Marlins have two all-stars, Sandy and jazz jazz won the fan vote to be the starting second baseman. First, Marlin position player to be voted in by the fans since Ozuna in 2017. Just the sixth ever Ozo. Marlin yep. to be voted in by the fans. And the, as we've known that we've talked about before, first Bahamian born player to be an all-star. And the main thing is, let's hope he's healthy enough to play. He's been on the IL since the since the end of the Cardinal series with a right lower back strain. He's been progressing with baseball activities. He played catch out the 90 feet on Monday. He said his, he said when he got named the All-Star on Friday that his hope was to be back on the field at some point this week. It's looking like he'll be cutting it close to whether or not he'll be playing in L.A. a week from today, a week from today as of the recording of this podcast. Yeah, I mean, if he can even make a pinch hit appearance, it'd be nice because, you know, that way you get that experience of at least, you know, getting into the game, suiting up, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. I mean, he's going to experience every – you know, all the, all the trimmings of it, the weekend, mingling here and there. Yeah. He'll enjoy all of that just fine. Exactly. That, that's <laughs> that's not a problem. But it'd be nice, if, like I said, if he, and it's a shame because, you know, here's a guy who could even have been in the Derby maybe if yeah. he was fine. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, he's that, I mean, and someday he probably will. I mean, if he gets in again, I'm sure he's a candidate to get invited at some point. But, but yeah, you hope he can be, now, in big picture terms, you do want him not to do, you know, to, to kind of keep progressing and get back on the, the, the field that they really need him to be on, yes. which is <laughs> in this push that we're talking about, if they can make it, <clears throat> Jazz Chisholm is going to have to be front and center in any effort they have to make the playoffs. So you hope for that. But switching to I me, mean, to Sandy, you know, I, I keep everybody keeps saying, yes, he's the most deserving guy to be the starter. But, you, you know, you just... <sighs> You just you, know they're not, like, like it's gonna oh, be we know they're gonna they're not gonna give it to they're, they're gonna give it to one of the Dodgers. They're gonna probably give it to Kershaw or or if not Gonsolin. It's it's the home team. You know they're gonna yep. do that. Unfortunately, yep. I, I mean if they don't, bravo. Then good for you know integrity and giving it to the guy who's had the best season. But even if he comes in in the third inning, let's say, that's that's still a tremendous step for his career. To that you know because he he's he's already pitched in one. But this is cool. Like when you get to be, and, and usually in these All Star games, at least the last few years, they get decided kind of early. They get you know some big, some clutch. The, the, whatever that pivotal moment happens tends to happen with some. Not even like the first, second inning, but like third, fourth, fifth, when those guys kind of settle in and kind of start you know playing a little more baseball than just you know hey what's up and saying you know and going around and taking pictures and whatnot. So we'll see. It'll be a fun experience. And then to start the weekend. The futures game, the guy, the, the 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 potential phenom that everybody's excited about, Yuri Perez. I I, I got to watch that futures game now. Yeah, that's gonna be fun. Yeah, I mean, nineteen year old Yuri Perez lighting up Double A. Uh, need to actually pull up the exact numbers from the story I wrote the other day. But again, he's just been absolutely fantastic. Again, facing competition above his above his age the entire the entirety of the season was 18 when he started in double a and it's his last 10 starts. He's hovering around a sub two ERA. Uh, here it is his last 10 starts, 1.98 ERA, 11 earned runs over 50 innings, 69 strikeouts against just nine walks, 166 batting average against 70% of his pitches have landed for strikes. 19 years old, upper minors. He's 
in the latest round of updates on both MLB Pipeline and Baseball America. He's now the Marlins' top prospect. Baseball America so, has so him as very soon. Is, 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 is he is he even going to be able to uh, watch uh, Yuri pitch? Uh, I would think so. Mr. Scampy here is he ever, is he going to get to soon or is he just going to? Yeah, I would think probably at some point late this year. They're not. They're obviously they're not going to bring him up to the majors this year. They're going to give him the full year to to do yeah. what he needs to do, get settled and not just rush him up for the sake of saying, hey, let's call him up. Plus, they yeah. also have Max Meyer, who I would think they're going to try to get up, have make yeah. his debut before Yuri. Of course. So, but I would think at some point this year, he'll be up in triple, he'll, he'll get a chance to be up in triple A. And just watching the development, again, the kid's 6'8", his fastball hits in the mid-90s, touches upper 90s. He has the eight mid-80s change up, the curveball. His release point for his height is basically he's able to repeat his delivery, which was one of the biggest question marks for him going in, just or the biggest potential cause for concern. And again, he's 19 doing this. And even when he has a rough value or gives up a couple of bad plays, he just he just goes, okay, and moves on to the next batter. He doesn't let his past any past mistakes phase him. And to see that that young and see that maturity to me is a very good sign of what's to come. Everything you said after the fastball is what was missing, um, where it was all like speculation and potential and projection. Um, like I remember when I was doing the BA book uh, a year and a half ago, I put him as a like, as a rising you know sleeper. Like I didn't have him yet in the top third. No, no one really had him that prominent yet. They just had him as keep an eye on whatever phrase you use for your company type of guy. Mm -hmm. And to see him go from that to now he's the top prospect in their system and one of the top 20 overall. Yeah. Yeah, top 20. A yeah. Year and a half. Baseball America has him at 9 overall. Yeah, and yeah, MLB has 10. him at 16. I mean yeah. I mean that's in a year and a half, year and 3 quarters more or yep. less. That's a that's a hell of a rise. So it's impressive though. So let's see. I mean with that body frame and most importantly, I say the, everything you said after the fastball because I think those were the elements that you were waiting to see if he can be the complete package. So, again, we're it's it's all development little by little, but a, a great step that he's taken in the last you know close to two seasons there, and, and we'll see we'll see how he can build on. This will be another good experience. We've seen guys come to the futures game and show their skills before, show in, in tiny little glimpses, but still. And then we've seen that fade, or we've seen it be a building block. So let's see if Yuri can use that as a building block. Yeah, no doubt about it. And now a couple other minor league quick hits just before we do this and wrap up with final bit. Uh, Khalil Watson, Marlins' first-round pick last year. Yeah. He hasn't played since July 1st. He hasn't been in the around the team since July 1st. From what I've been told, uh, it's disciplinary reason, not injury, which mm – -hmm. Causes some flags to be raised. A uh, couple people I've talked to, they didn't provide specifics, but said that there, he could potentially return at some point this week and the situation's been handled internally. Do with that what you will. Interpret that how you want. We hopefully more specific will be provided in the near future, but that's obviously not an ideal situation for arguably your top position player prospect, number 51 overall prospect in baseball. And a guy who you thought was a steal when you got him in the draft at 14 last year. Yeah. No. And, and we, look, we don't know the details exactly, but it's unfortunate to be right because here's a guy you thought was going to, well, you think in the present tense still could be, has the potential to be another, you know, on, on, on that jazz type level where eventually when he would be ready, you have another dynamic type middle infielder that can be a potential impact, impactful player. And yeah, that's concerning because, you know, you, you don't know obviously where that could lead and it sets you back if it does fall through because you, you were, th that, that was a, another guy, another cornerstone you were counting on. So hopefully things get resolved and he can get himself back on track and, and, uh, and progressing toward, towards his goal and, and team's goal for him, you know, in, in, in a relatively short amount of time. We'll see. We'll see how that situation develops. Yeah. And now on the positive side, going to talk about Andre's favorite infielder prospect here, Jose Salas. <laughs> in his two weeks since being promoted to high A Beloit, 
333 average, 16 for 48, two doubles, two home runs, eight RBI, eight runs scored, and four stolen bases in 11 games. Six of his 11 games, multi hit outings, including a five for five, three RBI effort on Saturday. Seems to have made that transition up to up from Jupiter to Beloit pretty well. He's not getting up there that quickly, Andre. He is no, not getting uh, no, tell him that. Tell him yeah. that. He's excited. He hears yeah. that and he's like, when when do I see him? When do I see him? No, look, he wants to see him. No, I yeah. think I think that I don't have a blue Wahoos mascot with me, but and <laughs> if I did, I'd say that he'd be the one to be, you know, wait your turn, Scampy. <laughs> yeah. And then lastly, uh Giddy Cape, Marlins top international free agent signing from 2021. Uh, he's been doing pretty well in the floor, the rookie level Florida complex league. I actually got the name right in the first try this time. I'm very happy with that. Five home runs, 21 RBI over 24 games for Giddy Cape, which again, this is the first real glimpse that we're getting to see from him. He was in the Dominican summer league last year. Uh, he's finally playing stateside this year. And if things play out well, possibly see him that last month, maybe go from the backfields in Jupiter to the main field in Jupiter for a little bit. Now that, Especially with Salas moving up and whatever happens with Watson, that some infield spots could be some infield playing time could be opening up there. I don't, I don't have a Hammerheads mascot with me either, but I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure the shark I'm sure the shark's excited to see Yiddy Cafe. But I'll, oh, that in all seriousness, it'd be it's a it's it's a pencil down like a trip to Jupiter later in the year. Assuming that does happen, it'd be good to see and and good to see that he's developing. Yep, but, and then yeah. yeah, and then just they, the last thing to talk about: uh, World Baseball Classic. Finally yes, sir. I was going to say, I'm like, we yeah. better mention that. No, we are definitely talking about World Baseball Classic, even though it's going to be quick. I know we have, yeah, we have other things we got to get done this morning. But finally, after the 2021 WBC got canceled because of COVID, about a week and a half, two weeks after it was announced that Miami, the Lone Depot Park, then Marlins Park, it didn't have the name change yet, were yeah. was going to be hosting in every round. They, it was announced last week that it's back, 2023 March. Uh, Lone Depot Park again, just like it was supposed to in 2021. It'll be one of the four hosts for pool play, one of the two hosts for the quarterfinals, and it will host the entirety of the semifinals and the finals. Dre, you got to cover some of it in 2017. What are we getting ourselves into? A full a full ballpark. <laughs> I mean, to start off, I mean that's yeah. the one time I've seen the place packed uh, completely. Um. I mean, seriously, because even yeah. I, I didn't even think the All Star Game was too packed to the final seat the way this event was when when the Dominican Republic played there. So I think it, it's it, it's another atmosphere completely, and it's not just about putting all everyone in all you know occupying every seat in the stadium. It's the atmosphere, it's the the crowd, the excitement, everything, and and then some good baseball too, because you're talking about some of the best players in the world. And a lot of these teams, and then the fact that you're going to have you're going to have it decided here. I mean, I, I, it's huge for Miami. It's huge for them to have it because that that was a big get when they did the first time. And you wondered, are they going to have it? Are they going to be able to keep it because of everything that happened? It's a good thing that they did, and and that final stretch run is going to be cool. But I think that first round is going to be a lot of fun too because. When you look at that bracket, it's uh -huh. already being called kind of like kind of like the, the FIFA World Cup is talks about a group of death. You put you put Puerto Rico, Venezuela, and the Dominican Republic in the same group. Good luck. I mean, yeah. poor Israel and poor Sorry, Israel, Final yeah, is, 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 Israel has improved a lot, and I'm sure they're going to be fun to watch too. But I am sorry for the schedule that you're about to get in that pool play, and whoever the automatic qualifier is, even more, because wow! I mean, so whenever those three teams when they match up against each other, it's going to be ridiculously good games. And on top of that, I think that that those are the games that you're going to see probably sell out crowds are pretty close. I think yeah. on those days for sure, those are going to be the fun ones. Yeah, so just to look ahead to the exact dates, the the qualifying pool, the pool play round that will be hosted in Miami is March 11th to March 15th. Those five teams: Puerto Rico, Venezuela, the DR, Israel, Israel, and the last team that still needs to be determined by the qualify by a qualifying tournament. March 11th to March 15th, every team plays each other once. The top two teams, after they've all played their four games, move on to the next round. Uh, and the next round, the quarterfinals will be. March 17th and 18th, the 
it'll be the top two from the Lone Depot Park bracket versus the top two from the pool that's playing in Phoenix, which is the United States, Mexico, Colombia, Canada, and another to be determined qualifying team. And then semifinals March 19th to 20th, championship March 21st. Right. So the U.S. would make it down here in later rounds, potentially. Yes, they would make but, it if, if they advance through the pool play. The U.S. would be make it for the court. U.S. Right. court would be in the quarterfinal. No, right, the, right. And, yeah, the U.S. would be in the quarterfinal pod with whoever advanced from the Lone Depot Park pod. Yeah, I mean, again, it's on. It's to you to use one example like that. It's also kind of cool is when you see also to pick one name like Manny Machado, a Miami guy playing for the Dominican, like it happened last time. I mean, and the play at home, like that, that's just an example of like how cool this event is that you could come home to your hometown and then play for your home country too, in front of the, the your, your home country, like your, your, your brother and your home, your, your fellow Dominicans, let's say. No, it's, it's, it, it was, it was, a, it was really fun to cover in, in 2017. And I think it definitely will be again. And it's good to have it back too. Yeah. Yep. We only have to wait seven months, Andre, seven months. Yeah, right around yeah. spring training. You better you better find someone to uh, not not that I'm not that I'm your boss or anything, but you better find someone to to take your spot in Jupiter for a few days. Yeah, we'll we'll make it work. We'll make it work. Okay. We got we have time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yep. And on that note, that's gonna wrap us up for this week's episode of Fish Bites. Thanks so much for tuning in. Next week's gonna be a pretty jam packed episode. We got our first half of well, our first half season recap, the highs, the lows, what to expect going into the second half of the season another all-star preview and we'll be able to talk some MLB draft with round one being on Sunday. So at least be able to break down the first day, the first two picks that the Marlins make on the next, on next week's episode and give some insights into what they might get and what they might do the rest of the draft. So with that, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll be back again next week, everyone.